Is this on? How are you this morning? <laughs> well, okay. It's great, isn't it? First uh, Sunday of Advent. Hasn't it come around quick? <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, for us, our house, it's a mad panic. Is your house mad? Or panicky? Or just mad? <laughs> I've got no idea what goes on in your house. But um, uh, thank you for Chris, wherever Chris has gone. Um, Chris has been so busy this week um, in loads of different things. Um, we have a football WhatsApp, and um, you wouldn't believe how busy Chris is on the football WhatsApp. <laughs> Never stops. He's just so committed to the work of the Lord. Um, messaging about football, about boxing, uh, about who's going to get certain uh, prizes that we shouldn't ever want. But just thank you, Chris, for leading us this morning. Uh, thank you for a surge last night. Uh, thank you for all you're doing with, uh, with the young men and young women of the church. So just really appreciate that. Uh, um, I've sort of been sat at home uh, watching all that Chris is doing. And it's exciting to have uh, young men, young men of God, who are leading within our church environments. And we believe that as the children go out to live wires and the different things they're involved in, that in this church we're building young men and young women of God uh, for today that are going to make a difference in this generation, in this time and in this day. Um, it's exciting to be part of a church that invests not just time but finances into young people of this generation. Uh, and I know that I'm blessed to have... Uh, uh, children and young people that are part of this environment as well. This is the first Sunday of Advent and we're really excited. I've called this uh, sermon Expected Arrival. It was great um, uh, preparing for this sermon because um, Sarah and Hal, who some of you will know, uh, we had a planned dedication this morning for their little uh, baby Zach. Unfortunately, Reuben's not very well and they've popped him off to hospital, but he's out now and he had a few breathing problems. So we had to cancel the dedication. I don't know about uh, you, uh, if you preach, and I know for Peter and myself, sometimes we have to think on our feet. And last night as I was watching Aston Villa uh, beat Middlesbrough 3-0, I got to just slip that in. I got a text from Sarah to say... Um, can we cancel the dedication? And all my sermon notes were all interspersed with the child, the dedication, the coming of Jesus, and all of these exciting things. I, I had to finish watching the football, and then when the football finished, then I had to start uh, re-preparing uh, for this morning. But it's exciting, and it's challenging to have to do that. So this morning's sermon is called Expected Arrival. A nation waits for a baby to arrive. The nation of Israel was waiting for Jesus to come and they'd waited for thousands and thousands of years. And for us today, uh, the reverse is true, that we're waiting for Jesus to come back. And the moment Jesus left <clears throat> in Acts, I think it's the beginning of Acts when Jesus ascended into heaven, two angels uh, told the disciples uh, how he's gone one day he's going to come back. So in the same way with the nation of Israel, we're, they were waiting, they were talking, they were discussing, they were debating, they were thinking, they were expectant that Jesus was going to come. And for us today, we're in exactly the same situation. We're expecting the arrival of Jesus to come back to this earth, to take those that know him, those that love him, those that believe in him, those that follow him to be with him. And I wonder whether we're ready for that arrival. I know for Jackie and I, when uh, we had our lovely children, Jackie did a little bit more than I did, but we, there was a period where we were expectants. Uh, and it, we had an odd phrase that we would use to people, we're expecting a baby. And we'd say that a lot, wouldn't we? And I've heard other people say, oh, we're expecting a baby. And I've sort of looked at them as though that's a really, really strange expression. 
because it's really only the, the lady that's really expecting and the obvious signs uh, come across with the the bump and the uh, the mood swings uh, no uh, the bump and the uh, the happiness and joy that uh, is attached to, to that occasion uh, but we're expecting a baby in the nation of israel we're expecting a baby they're expecting jesus to come and they're expecting jesus to come and and, and sort of storm into Jerusalem and take over uh, the world as a, as a, as a warrior, as a, as a, as a, as a powerful, uh, life-changing uh, saviour. Well, we know the second part of that was true, but the first part was that he came as a servant. He came in humility and he came born as a baby. So point number one, Isaiah 61 verses one to three. I'm going to read this. Uh, Chris read it to us earlier, and this is our focus scripture for this morning the spirit of the sovereign lord is on me because the lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners and the day of vengeance of our lord to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Would Jesus be that? You see, when we are awaiting and anticipating the arrival of Jesus, what are we really understanding what are we really expectant for what are we really believing for what is jesus really going to do in our lives what is really going to happen to us that is different to what normally happens to us and i i believe that uh, jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy you see, when a baby is born, when a normal baby is born, um, no one really knows, do they? They don't know what those children are going to become. You sort of have them, and basically you're just trying to get through every day. Is that true? Uh, anyone who's got a baby or, or thinking about having a baby, you're just trying to get through every day. And, and occasionally someone will say, oh, he seems to be tall. Perhaps he'll be a rugby player. Or he might have big hands. Perhaps you'll be a, a farmer or a carpenter. So sometimes people prophesy or predict what they think that particular child is going to be. Oh, he's good at football. Could be the next Ryan Giggs. People get excited about these things. But when Jesus was coming, the nation of Israel and perhaps even the world was expecting that Jesus would do things very different to what a normal baby was going to be. So point number two is that Jesus did and was the fulfillment of this prophecy. And I want to just drill into this for a few minutes. Is that all right? You got a few minutes? Oh, you, you have, haven't you? I know that. So the first part, and we look at Isaiah 61 verse 1, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Jesus had the anointing of God, didn't he? He had the powerful anointing of God. At his baptism, the Spirit of God was on him and in him and throwing out from him and through him. The anointing of God. We sung it in one of our songs that Jesus is the incarnation of God. God with flesh on, God with bones on, came to this earth to change and transform the world that we know today but Jesus came with a purpose and I, I, I love having purpose I love people with purpose I'm excited about being part of a church that's church with purpose perhaps we should be called Bethel Ponteclean church with purpose because I see in a lot of you not all of you because I don't know you but those that are getting to know you're here with a purpose 
You're here with a destination. Yeah, destination is heaven, but you're, you're going for it. And so I love that the, this week we've been collecting at a food bank and I'm a bit of a lightweight pastor, so I only came in for one day. But I tell you what, the energy and effort and the passion and the commitments of people that aren't quite as fit and strong as they used to be. And I'm not going to be disrespectful to anyone that's involved with food bank. But you know what? Your passion comes from in here. It doesn't come from here. My legs are strong. My arms are strong. No, it comes from within here. And the, the passion and purpose that's within people, within this church environment, only says to me that we've got so much more that we can do. The potential of this church gathering, this church community. There, there's, there's no end to it. And you need to sometimes look up and not look down. Because this place is full of purpose. It's full of drive and it's full of commitments that comes from within here. See, Jesus came with purpose. And Jesus came to preach good news to the poor. Mark chapter 1, 14 and 15. And I'll just flick over to this. I think I can find Mark. Mark chapter 1. And it's right at the beginning when Jesus is calling the, uh, the disciples. Mark 1, 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And then Jesus says, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. You see, our mandate, if we're followers of Jesus, if we're committed to what he's called us to do, our mandate is to preach good news to the poor. In other words, for us to be good news. For us to be good news, wherever it is that God calls us and takes us, whatever environment God places us in, we take that good news because Jesus preached the good news to the poor. On one hand, Jesus gave out a tin of beans. See, I've been involved with food bank. Now I know about the beans. Don't give beans to food bank. They go crazy. They start shouting at you. They grab you by the throat. We don't want any more beans. Ah! On one hand, Jesus gave out beans. <laughs> And on the other hand, Jesus gave out the good news. Repentance, salvation, transformation of your present and your eternal destiny. Jesus came as good news. Came to preach good news to the poor. And sometimes the easiest thing we can do is just give someone a cup of water. But then be afraid to pray for them. Would you like some water? Oh yeah, thank you. Would you like me to pray for you? Do you know what? I'm, I, I'm sure others can testify to this. I've never, perhaps this will happen in Bethel, but I've never had one person that I've ever said, would you like me to pray for you? Ever say no. No one's ever said no. And some of you will get used to me. I'm not a, I'm not a long prayer. I'm not a, I won't shout or, or stamp my feet. Ah, come on! I, I, you know, just pray for you just calmly and gently. A little bit edgy this morning, sorry. <laughs> I just pray like an ordinary person. The power comes from God, not from my shouting. I, I won't breathe on you or blow on you or I won't do anything weird. But not one person has ever said, John, I don't want you to pray for me. Cup of water. Pray. And you know, in that moment of prayer, so often people are opening up their hearts to the Lord. Come to preach good news. Come to bind up the brokenhearted. See, Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted. We sang it, didn't we, Chris, in that last song? Jesus has come at, at some point in your life. You're going to feel broken hearted. You're going to feel let down in your life. You're going to feel massively disappointed with the dreams and visions and expectations 
you had of life. The hopes and the dreams and the visions and the, 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 the conversations, the, the expectation of what was happening in life, the, the marriage that you were part of, the children that you gave birth to, the employers that you, that you worked for, the, 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 the sports group that you were involved in. You're going to feel let down by God. God, why have you allowed this to happen? My marriage, my child, my life partner is now gone. Jesus came not to just preach, but to bind up. And bind up isn't a restriction. It's a freedom. <laughs> Do you get it? To be bound up isn't a restriction, it's a freedom. Imagine, I'm not, not going to do this because this is a bit creepy. But if you ever had someone put their full arms around you and just hold you tight when you're at your lowest points. And some of you this morning are sitting there wondering, I wish I could have that happen. I wish somebody would just put their arms of love around me and hold me tight. The creepy thing about churches is that some human beings try to do this. And quite often in church you come in and uh, someone's struggling and they're going through a hard time and a big fat sweaty man comes up to you and puts his arms around you and says we love you or a, a, a strange woman that you've never met kisses you and we think we're binding up the broken hearted I, I want you to know that the God of love the Jesus of compassion the Holy Spirit counsellor and comforter can do that in your life for you. Some of you live alone. As the winter comes, you just want someone to be with you. Strictly Come Dancing won't give you what you need. Oh, I think they're all rubbish, to be honest. They should all be voted off all on the same day. Wouldn't that be brilliant? If I was one of the judges, I'd say, this day, you're all going. Imagine what that would do to the country. There'd be war, wouldn't there? There'd be war. But it's meant to go on for another three weeks and we've got this big show at the end. Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted. And you need to come to him. And he will embrace you. Jesus will show you those emotions. Jesus wept. Jesus had compassion. Jesus' love towards all goes into a deep place. And sometimes what we do in church is a little bit superficial. You don't have to say amen, but it's true. We come in, we sing some songs listen to a preacher, someone says your shirt is nice, John, and it's a little bit superficial. But the Jesus I know and the Jesus that I follow, he wants to go deep with us, into that deep place, into that hurting place, into that place of despair, that place of I'm about to give up, I'm about to, 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 to lose what I had. I'm about to walk away from someone I love. I'm about to make a decision that I'll regret for the rest of my life. Jesus wants to come into that deep place with you and with me. And I know, because there are some times when pastors go into that deep place and we feel alone. We feel let down. We feel disappointed. And we feel discouraged. Jesus came to proclaim freedom for the captives. Wow. 
John 8, 36. So if the sun sets you free, you'll still be a captive. No, no. Is that, thank you. <laughs> if the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. How many um, Christians aren't free? You see, when Jesus proclaims good news to the poor, he also proclaims freedoms for the captives. See, we're all lost in sin at some point, aren't we? We're all dead. We're all away from Christ. We're all in that place where we don't know him. We don't have that relationship with him. But when we come to him, we receive him. We accept him. We enter into that relationship with him. Do you know we experience, yeah, we might still be poor. We might still have no money. We might still be struggling financially, but we're rich in him. And then when, we pro, when he proclaims that freedom over our lives, and I want to do that this morning. I want to do that. In Jesus' name, we proclaim freedom over your life. Should we, should we, do, should we have a go at that? Should we have a go? Because I believe that God is here. I believe that the Holy Spirit is here this morning. And that we can proclaim that freedom. That freedom in him, not in me, not in Chris, not in any other leaders, not in anything else. But we proclaim the freedom in Christ through the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. So we do it this morning. This might be a bit weird. It might be a bit creepy. It might be a bit strange. You might not have experienced that before. But we proclaim freedom. We proclaim freedom in the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You see, the expected arrival, Jesus has now come. Jesus is, is here. Jesus ascended into heaven. Jesus left this powerful Holy Spirit, and his Holy Spirit is here. We proclaim freedom. If the sun sets you free, you're going to be free. You'll be free indeed. And some of you need to wriggle free. Some of you need to get away from the chains of your past. And you know, I, I, I fight that all the time. And I've had a background and a, a past and issues that I've been involved in. And you fight that. I was talking the other day to, uh, to Chris and Meg in the office. And I said, you know, sometimes when I'm preaching, the devil puts images of my past in front of me. And sometimes I can't see you. I can at the moment. Adrian's there. I can see his face smiling away. But sometimes I can't see you. And I just see images of my past. But you know, I proclaim freedom over my past in the name of Jesus. And you're looking at me a bit creepy this morning. You're wondering what's going on. But I've got to tell you that you're free. And who the sun sets free is free indeed. And I see so many Christians, not just in Bethel, that are just products of your past. I want you to be free. I've got uh, uh, one more point and then we're going to stop. So hand back to the, the band. But we're released from darkness. See, when you follow through this uh, passage... He's proclaimed freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. We were dead in our sin, but now we're uh, alive to God in Christ Jesus. Romans 6, 11. We're dead in our sin, outside of Christ. And when we didn't know him, when we didn't have a relationship with him, when we weren't clear about who he was and what he'd done, we were dead in our sin and we were outside of Christ. But when we enter in and we receive him as our Lord and Savior and our very, very best friend, when we allow him to take control of our lives, we've, we become alive to God. And sometimes you'll meet Christians and you go, hey, they're alive. <laughs> they're alive. Or you might have people that you work with and they say to you, there's something different about you. The way that you live, the way that you talk. The way that you interact, the way that you think, the way that you work and deal with people in the workplace. Wow, they're alive.
Uh, we, we'll, click, we'll click the last. Uh, um, thanks, thanks, Carl. There's a responsibility shift. And you see, we can talk about all the great things that Jesus did. But as we are expecting his return, we've been left the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, um, I've got to tell you, doesn't just sort of hover around in this building during the day uh, on a Sunday. You know, during the week, this building here is pretty empty. Len runs about in his shorts up and down the stairs and runs about and is very active doing lots of things and fantastic and Jim and Nick and, you know, there's a few things going on. But the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit fills us, equips us and enables us to do the things that Jesus has been doing. And all of those things that I shared with you just a few minutes ago, the Holy Spirit's equipped us and enabled us to be the church that will make a difference in this day and in this time. And when the whole world is potentially going in one direction, the church is countercultural. We're different. We do things differently. We say things differently because the power of God is at work in us to change our families, to change our workplaces, and to change our communities. So, are you ready? Are you ready for when Jesus comes back? The children of Israel, the nation of Israel, many of them weren't ready when Jesus was born because Jesus came back in an unexpected place and an unexpected way. Are you ready? If Jesus came back today, he came back this afternoon and I'm really hoping he comes back this afternoon because I don't want to embarrass you at Quizioki. <laughs> Deck the halls are going to win, aren't we? We've got the brains, got James, Hannah and uh, the other child I have. Um, we, we, got the, we got the brains. We're ready. Our brains are in place. Ready for Quizioki. If Jesus came back this afternoon, what would he find? Would he find a church? Would he find an individual selection of people ready for his return? Chris, if you come back and uh, get us ready. See, in a moment, we're going uh, to we're going to take communion and. It's a beautiful, beautiful table. It's a table that represents the death and resurrection of Jesus. And in Jesus, we find that life. See, life, the Christian life has to start somewhere. And it could start this morning. It could start right at this moment with an act of will, an act of desire, where you say, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus, I give my life to you. So. As we sing, um, we come and prepare to take communion. Um, just start to get yourself ready. Jesus, I want to be ready. I want to be ready to serve you. And I want to be ready to receive you when you come. Thank you.